Hello, I'm Jacob Pruger, and this is the Write Your Screenplay Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about The Queen's Gambit by Scott Frank and Alan Scott. And as we look at The Queen's Gambit, this is actually the first time since Chernobyl that we've looked at a limited series. So I want to talk a little bit about limited series, how they work, and, and also how they've changed over the years. I actually came up in the world of limited series. Um, but back in the day when we thought about limited series, we called them mini series. And when we thought about limited th- series, we thought about giant, sprawling, epic movies with a tremendous amount of plot, right? So much plot, so many subplots, so many twists and turns, so many characters, such huge historical scope that you couldn't fit it into a movie. Um, When we thought about miniseries back in the day, we were looking for movies that, that were on topics that people already kind of had a feeling that they knew about. Um, but, uh, but that maybe they didn't know the real story, something, something really big because miniseries were expensive and hard to sell and hard to make. Um, so in other words, we were looking for movies back in those days that were a little bit more like Chernobyl. When you look at the Queen's Gambit, you see that the face and the scope of limited series of miniseries is completely, completely changed um, because the Queen's Gambit actually started out as a novel and the first adaptation happened 10 years before as a feature film. And although it was written by the same writer, they could not sell it. In fact, uh, everyone thought nobody's gonna be interested in chess. This story is too small. And it was after doing Godless that uh, they came up with the idea 10 years later what if we did it as a mini series? What if we did it as a limited series? But not one of these epic plot driven historical kinds of series. What if we did it as the kind of series that allows you to drop into the eyes of a character? So what's really interesting is back in the days where I was coming up, if you pitched the Queen's Gambit as a limited series, you would never be able to sell it. And yet today it's become one of the most popular, in fact, the most popular limited series in Netflix's history. And so I I wanna talk about what made The Queen's Gambit work. And I also wanna talk about what's so different about it structurally, the many things that The Queen's Gambit does that maybe shouldn't work. And maybe for even some people didn't work, but the way that these filmmakers made something that was greater than the sum of its parts, right? Because when you look at The Queen's Gambit, you should be looking at a movie that is too small to even be a movie, much less a miniseries. It's about chess, which is a sport that unlike football or baseball or these typical sport movies that get made, is a sport that nobody knows anything about, that you can't follow. It's really hard to cheer, right? You don't even know where the end zone is unless you are an expert. You can't even look at the board and go, oh my God, checkmate. So you have essentially a sports movie that's not a sports movie. You have have a a, a movie based around a game where the audience can't tell if you're winning. But you also have another really interesting thing going on, which is you have a character who for the most part doesn't form relationships, whose primary relationship is with chess, is with an inanimate object. Um, And even though the miniseries, the limited series spans six hours, over six hours of filmmaking, the characters come and go, appear and disappear. So for example, if you look at the first episode, it looks like this is gonna be a movie about her relationship with Jolene, two Uh, orphans who are never going to be adopted, except Jolene disappears for multiple episodes. She's gone, not just gone from the movie, but gone from Beth's mind. She's not shaping and affecting Beth because Beth isn't connecting to people. It's actually central to her character that she doesn't connect to people, that she struggles to connect with people. 
You have the kind of Mrs. Hannigan character at the orphanage and you think, oh, it's going to be about this complicated relationship between these two people. But no, that's not what the story is going to be about either. I'll call her Mrs. Hannigan. She's going to disappear, the, the woman who runs the orphanage, until the end of the miniseries. And she's not going to end up having a profound effect on Beth's life, except for being the person who introduced her to tranquilizers. You think of the uh, of the janitor, uh, and you think, oh, I get it. This is going to be a relationship between this man who can't communicate and this incredibly vulnerable but also closed down genius little girl. And it's going to be a complicated relationship between the two of those people. But he also disappears for the rest of the movie. Again, not just from the plot, but from Beth's mind. Beth loses track of him. The only time she reaches out to him is when she needs a few dollars. And she doesn't think about him again until she goes home back to the orphanage. So this is another character who comes and goes. It's not a love story. Yes, there are men that she has sex with. There are men that she dates. But her primary relationship remains with the chessboard. Uh, remains with getting high or not getting high. Her primary character relationships come and go just like the characters in the movie. So you th start to think, oh, it's going to be her relationship with this dude. No, it's not. It's going to be her relationship with that dude. No, it's not. It's going to be her relationship with the chess master. No, it's not. These characters are going to come and go, come and go, come and go. And again, this is technically what we would normally think of is wrong, right? Normally when we build a movie and especially when we build a miniseries, what we're building is a continuous relationship, a long, deep relationship that's gonna develop over time. So if you think of a movie like Chernobyl, for example, really it's the relationship between those two men that drives the whole darn movie. And sure, there's a couple of subplots that we weave in between, as, as I discussed in my Chernobyl podcast. But you're really talking about let's go really deep in a relationship for six hours. In this movie, that relationship doesn't develop that way. Characters come in for an episode or a couple of episodes and then they disappear. This is contrary even the way we normally think about series. You know, normally when you think about a TV comedy series or a TV drama series, you think about a, uh, a world where you're trying to get characters together who can't get away from each other. So they have to deal with each other and go on a journey together. Uh, but in this series, the characters don't stick. You think of mom, you go, oh, okay, I get it. She's going to be adopted into this very unhappy relationship. And horrible things are going to happen with this awful dad and this alcoholic, unhappy mom. But those things end up not happening. Dad goes away, and though he's not a great influence, he's not a terrible one. He does let her keep the house, kind of, right? He's not the relationship. And even mom, who ends up becoming the primary relationship in her life, even mom comes and goes. Even mom doesn't remain a staying force in her life. So all of these things are not supposed to work, right? This is not supposed to be how you build a movie. Uh, and if we want to go one level further, think about all the plot all the exciting twists and turns that don't happen. The moment we meet Mrs. Hannigan, we know who she is, right? I'm calling her Mrs. Hannigan. That's how much we know who she is. But all the drama and the chaos and the suffering that we expect between those two characters, the power struggle, it doesn't happen. As soon as you send this little girl down to that basement with that janitor, you're going, oh my God, it's either going to be sexual abuse or something else dark and complicated. But it doesn't happen. As soon as you send her to a family, as messed up 
as her adoptive family, you go, oh my God, it's gonna be about the toll that these people take on her. But it doesn't happen. As soon as you give her this disconnected, stiff, alcoholic, unhappy mom, you think, oh my God, it's going to be about the psychic torture of that. And though mom is part of creating the drug dependency, the alcohol dependency, she's not the sole cause of it. And she's not the end of it. And even her death is not the thing that really causes it to happen or to stop happening. The things that you expect to happen in the movie don't happen. Even when Beth finally goes to Moscow and she's there with the State Department guy who warns her to look for signs of defection. And you think, oh my God, that's the Queen's Gambit. It's going to be some kind of defection movie. That doesn't happen. In fact, what does happen is probably the most predictable thing, which is that she finds her way out of her addiction and she defeats the big Russian chess player, the best in the world. So all the things that are supposed to happen, all the drama that we think we're supposed to create, all that drama doesn't get created. In fact, every time the, the idea of the drama starts to come up, the writers steer away from the traditional drama, which goes to show you something very important. No one can tell you what has to happen in your movie. Now, the truth is, I don't know pre-COVID if The Queen's Gambit is the huge success it is today. I think one of the reasons that the Queen's Gambit is the success that it is, aside from Anya Taylor-Joy's absolutely tremendous performance, her ability to use her eyes to communicate meaning, uh, I think one of the reasons that it's such a success is because we as Americans, as people of the world, what do we need right now? We need an escape from the drama, right? We needed something that let us feel good for a little bit. We needed something that didn't go to the darkest or the worst place that looked pretty and took us on a kind of journey that made us feel hopeful at a time when we feel really dark. And why that's such an important lesson is that I've seen so many talented writers try to time the market, right? Try to write the hot script, the thing that they think is gonna sell. I've seen so many talented writers try to follow the rules, thinking that the rules are going to get you there. And the truth is by the time you're follow done following whatever the rules are today, the rules have changed because the rules don't get created by you. The rules get created by a vast environment that you have very little control over. 10 years ago, The Queen's Gambit was an impossible movie. That was too small to even be a movie about a topic that absolutely no one was interested in. Today, it is Netflix's highest viewed limited series of all time and has spawned a whole generation of interest in chess. Pre-COVID, The Queen's Gambit was too light. Post-COVID, or mid-COVID, it is just light enough. You've got to write the movies. You've got to write the series. You've got to write the miniseries that come out of you. You've got to tell the stories that you want to tell. And then you have to figure out, despite all the things that maybe I'm doing wrong, right? Despite all the things that I'm doing that maybe don't conform to what I've been told or what I've read in a screenwriting book. How am I going to make what's beautiful and good about my script? How am I going to make that thing so good that it transcends those other friction points? So I want to talk about friction points because really I've been talking about friction points this whole podcast. What's a friction point? A friction point is the reason that someone says no to your movie, right? A friction point is the excuse people use to say, no, this movie, this series, this mini series, no, I pass. 
the easy friction point at the beginning for the Queen's Gambit was chess. Sorry, we passed. It's about chess, dude. Even the director has admitted chess is the least visually exciting sport that you can follow, right? It's about chess. I'm sorry, dude. Friction point. Sorry, the characters, they come and go. They come and go. What, build, build some relationships, right? That's the kind of advice you'd likely get from a coverage reader. It's also the advice that would destroy the Queen's Gambit because the Queen's Gambit is about a character who cannot connect. That's actually what we're watching. In the journey, the reason that the ending is powerful with her dressed up in her white queen outfit, wandering amid the Russian chess players, right? Is because we're watching the thing in the community that she actually connects with, right? We're watching this person who can't connect, find connection. So if you follow the typical advice, if you try to sand out the friction of that friction point, you would end up with a movie that undid its own premise or a limited series in this case that undid its own premise. So you have to remember that the rules grow out of what you're trying to do. The rules aren't a bunch of, of written in stone commandments for you to follow. The rules need to serve your story. And so every good movie is gonna have friction points. Every good movie is gonna have reasons why people say no. And these are the things that people who don't know what they're doing, you have to be so careful who you take advice from. This is the things that coverage readers are going to make suggestions about, and they're going to make all the standard suggestions. Hey, maybe the creepy guy in the basement should molest her. Hey, what about that Mrs. Hannigan character? Hey, maybe more messed up stuff should happen between her and her mom. Hey, why don't you build a love story, right? You're going to get those suggestions around your friction points. And if you accept them, they're going to destroy your movie. They're going to take what's beautiful about your movie and they're gonna dull it down to a place where you get good coverage, but no one gets passionate. Where you get to the next round of the festival, but you don't get to the final round. Where people say, sure, what else have you got? but they don't go, oh my God, I need to make this. I need to see this. Because friction points, although they, also, they, although they do make your movie hard to sell, friction points are also what make people passionate about it. Because the friction points are the things that distinguish it. Now that doesn't mean create friction points for their own sake. If you've got a movie that's full of drama and action, please have fun with it. But remember that the form of your film, the form of your miniseries, the form of your limited series, the form of your TV show, it needs to follow the function. It needs to grow out of what you're trying to say and who these characters are. So once you know what your friction points are, the answer is never to smooth out your friction points. The answer is instead to feature them. Now, if the friction point ends up not being that important to your theme, by all means, get rid of it. If the friction point ends up not being that important to your character, by all means, get rid of it. If the friction point turns out not to be that important to you, by all means, get rid of it, right? Don't bite off your nose to spite your face, right? Don't make it harder than it has to be. But if the friction point ends up being important to you, then you want to find a way to allow the movie to become about the friction point. You want that friction point to become the important thing in the movie or in the limited series or in the TV show. And if you look at The Queen's Gambit, you can see that that's exactly what they did. What's exciting about The Queen's Gambit is not what happens, it's what doesn't happen. It's the gap between your expectations of darkness and the light that this troubled character keeps on finding, even as she navigates her own self-destruction. So what made it work? The first thing, they have a character with two exceptionally strong wants. And these two strong wants both complement and get in each other's way. So all characters have relationships. It just happens that this character's relationship is with chess, and with drugs. And both of these relationships start when she is a child. And for this character, 
those relationships are tied together. It is the drugs that allows her to escape her conscious mind and to see the chessboard in the sky. It is the drugs that allow her to be who she is as a chess player. She doesn't know how to be sober. She hasn't known how to be sober since she was a child. But it's also the drugs that end up leading to sabotage of her career. The same thing that's giving her this gift is also taking it away. And this character's very simple journey is that she needs to learn to play sober. She needs to learn to see sober. She needs to learn to do her art sober. And that is her journey in a nutshell. And both of those wants are really strong and the obstacles to both of those wants are really strong because even though she is the ultimate talent, right? We know from the very beginning that we're never gonna see a better chess player than Beth Harmon. Even though she's the ultimate talent, because she has these two competing wants, her want to get the drugs, her want to get high, her want to get stoned, her want to get drunk, and this want to win at chess, this want even beyond winning, because she's addicted to winning, but beyond winning, there's something else there, it's much deeper, right? This desire to know, to understand, to see. So you have these wants that are driving her, this want for chess with all these obstacles from the mom who won't buy her a chess board to having to learn in the basement, to being a woman, to not being respected, to not having money, to, uh, to undermining her own career, all these conflicts, these, these obstacles that get in the way that force her to make choices. So this gives you structure. And similarly, there are challenges to getting the drugs, right? When the, when the orphanage stops distributing the drugs to the kids and she has to climb in and sneak in and steal the drugs, right? When she discovers her mom's drugs and realizes she can get them that way. So there's a relationship that's developing there. There are obstacles that she's navigating and these obstacles relate to choices, there are men who are in love with her and these men are both aids and obstacles because there is not one of them, maybe the first one who's gay, but there's not really one of them that she really is in love with. They are aids in that they can teach her chess and they are obstacles and that they are going to want something from her that she cannot give back because her primary love is chess and because she struggles with human connection. And so the pressure between the love story that wants to happen and the choices that she keeps on making and the obstacle, the biggest obstacle of simply being smarter than everybody else, of simply being so smart that nobody can keep up with her, that even the people who are teaching her are ultimately disappointing having to navigate the loneliness of that. So the biggest thing that makes the Queen's Gambit work is that despite breaking every other rule, it follows as one really simple one, right? Which is the character's gotta want things and those things have gotta be really hard to get. And they've gotta be so hard to get that the character has to keep making new choices, choices that change them, choices that mess them up, choices that transform them and allow them to transcend. So despite all the ways that the Queen's Gambit is totally flaunting the rules, this one simple idea stays with you that the character's gonna want stuff and it's gotta be hard to get. The second thing that Queen's Gambit does that allows it to transcend is the way it captures world. And world is something that we should probably talk more of on this podcast um, because world is so important. And it's one of those amorphous things that we kind of sometimes don't know exactly how to use. We know that the world of every story is super important, but in a lot of movies and a lot of lesser movies and a lot of lesser miniseries and even a lot of lesser TV shows, the world is kind of a barely realized thing. It's there, but it's not there. 
But if you look at the Queen's Gambit visually, you can see the way they amplified the world. They amplified the period, how every location is incredibly beautiful, but also incredibly interesting. This is another trick you can take from the Queen's Gambit is really think about where are you setting your scenes? Really think about what does your scene look like? And not like a set designer. Ultimately, just like the Queen's Gambit, you're gonna bring in brilliant designers who are going to create your interiors and your exteriors and, and who are going to make sure your script looks right. More, how are you visualizing your world, the world yourself? And how is the character interacting with that world? What are the things they're doing in that world that are gonna bring that world to life? So think of the visual imagery. And if you're a director, then you can even think about scenically how they used world to, by amplifying world, by amplifying the poetic qualities of the world. They made up for some of the things that we would normally expect to see in a miniseries that weren't there. We didn't have the plot spectacle that we're used to in miniseries, but we did have the visual cinematic spectacle with everything from the costumes to the sets and the way that the characters moved through those worlds and those locations. So the visuals, um, if you take in my Write Your Screenplay class, the way we talk about isolating visual moments of action to hypnotize the reader and think about the way the Queen's Gambit hypnotized you hypnotized you visually to a way that you might have even not noticed that in so many scenes there is so little going on. In a way that you might have not noticed how little plot there actually is in the Queen's Gambit. So by amplifying this one really cool thing and by playing that drumbeat of want obstacle completion, right? What the piece does is it elevates itself above being this tiny little story. There's a third element that is tied together with this, which is, this is a character whose main struggle is internal, right? Her main struggle is an internal struggle with drugs and alcohol, and an internal struggle with chess, and an internal struggle to decide if she's actually good enough or deserving enough. Her main journey happens on the inside, but in, and that works great in a novel, but in a movie, in a miniseries, in a limited series, in a, in a series, we must externalize the internal. We must take the internal thing and take it out of the character. And there are a couple of brilliant ways that the filmmakers did this. And the first and most obvious one is the way that they visualized those chess pieces. If you think of the visual eye candy of watching her play chess in her mind, if you think of the image of her ripping open the canopy of her bed in her new home so she can see the ceiling, if you think about her externalized struggle to unlock those chess pieces with drugs or without drugs, right? You can start to see how by externalizing this internal thing, the, the filmmakers gave you something to root for because you couldn't root in the traditional sports movie way for her to win because you couldn't tell if she was winning. Rather, you could root for her to see. And by reading her face and the interactions between her and the other chess players, players, even though in this way, at some point, uh, the Queen's Gambit did, did, did depart a little bit from the real rules of chess where characters don't speak to each other. By focusing on the interplay around the game and her personal journey around the game, it gave you something to root for. It, it allowed you to know that you are rooting for, is she seeing it or not? Is she able to visualize or not? Are the pieces appearing for her or is she stuck in her head? Which is the point I want to leave you with because just like Beth, so many of us as artists end up stuck in our head. 
we end up believing there's only one way we can get to that gift, whether it's something destructive like drugs or alcohol or uh, something beautiful like being captured by the muse or whether it's following a formula that worked before um, or is it only writing things that actually happened to you or only writing your own projects or not being able to take notes from other people, right? We all have these things, right, that, that either allow us to access our gift or feel like they're cutting them up or feel like they're cutting us off from our gift. And the beautiful thing about the Queen's Gambit is the way that Beth's journey is like ours because like all artists, Beth's journey is very simple, which is to take this raw and shapeless thing inside of her, this raw gift that we as writers call voice and that she calls chess. To take that internal thing that resides inside of us and wants to come out and to learn how to harness it, not how to harness it when we're out of control or when it happens to come to us, but to learn how to actually control and shape our gift, to learn how to actually step into it. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I love to be a teacher. They say that you can't teach talent and uh, maybe that's true, uh, but I've always felt like as a teacher that talent is so unimportant. Um, Beth happens to be a character who has a lot of talent, but what we're actually watching is not her talent, which we're, what we're actually watching is her desire and her process. And what I've always found is when working with writers is that every single one of us has a voice. But what ends up happening to us is that our voice leads to friction points, right? Starting when we're little kids in school. And we learn to dull that voice. We learn to hide that voice. And sometimes we learn that there are only certain ways that we can unlock it and let it get free. And what I love about teaching, what I love about what I get to do as a writer, and, and also what I've been learning to do over a lifetime for myself, is not to be dependent on external circumstances to unlock that gift, but actually to become more comfortable with your own friction points to actually learn how to harness your friction points, those odd things about you, maybe even the things that you're ashamed of or that you feel inadequate about, and to realize that they are actually your gift and that your actual journey as an artist is to learn how to externalize them, learn how to get them out, not when they want to come out, but when you need them to come out, to learn how to shape them, and in that way, to take control of your artistic life. If you're enjoying this podcast and it's helping your writing, then come study with me. You can do it for free every Thursday night as part of our Quarantinis program, where a faculty member and I do a deep dive into some aspect of screenwriting, share a writing exercise with our fabulous community of screenwriters, and even give a little bit of feedback. It's a really wonderful experience. It's free or by donation, and all donations that are made are supporting our COVID scholarship fund, where we've given away over $98,000 of scholarships since March to help our students who have been affected by the crisis, afford our classes, and afford to be able to continue in our program. So if you'd like to be a part of that, then come join us. It's every Thursday night, writeyourscreenplay.com slash quarantine.